The UN is, after all, an organization of sovereign states. But states seem to mean less now to people than they once did. A different basis for multilateral architecture may be necessary to meet the goals of bringing social order, suppressing war, and establishing the rule of law. <clears throat> it's a big preoccupation around here as the United Nations ponders its 70th anniversary and faces up to the 21st century challenges that seem to be cropping up all over the world. You've heard about the UN bubble. You're in it right now. Quite literally, this trap this neighborhood represents with its missions and UN offices that keeps people from looking outward and traveling outside its confines. This is partly what has led us at IPI to create the commission I mentioned at the outset to look at the practice of multilateral diplomacy from an independent point of view. The chairman of our commission is Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia. And at the launch last fall, he said the current global order is under genuine systemic challenges on multiple levels. And it's important for us not to assume that it will function indefinitely. This means that the multilateral system with the UN at its core needs to be under constant review with a look at maintaining its relevance and effectiveness over time. <clears throat> Citing what I mentioned at the outset of these remarks, he said the problem for the global community is that all these things are happening now at the same time, causing strains and fractures in the current architecture. The Independent Commission on Multilateralism, uh, like all good things at the United Nations, uh, it has an acronym, we call it the ICM. The ICM is an international undertaking housed at the International Peace Institute, that over a two-year period is gathering input from experts, governments, civil society, and the private sector, and will culminate in a final report to be presented by the end of 2016. That report will, will include practical recommendations aimed at bolstering the existing multilateral system and equipping it with the right tools to confront the threats and challenges of the 21st century. Now, by design, the deadline for its completion coincides with the time that a new United Nations Secretary General will be taking office. If we get it right, I think we will be performing a great service to the UN and to the multilateral system in general. And I say that remembering the time when the current Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, came into office in 2007. I was then the New York Times correspondent covering the UN, and in that connection, I remember covering the run-up to his election and the interviewing of some of the final candidates, <clears throat> and as I said, pre presenting some of them uh, to the institutions around the city. And I remember I was shocked to discover that there really was no process for selecting the person who becomes the most important international civil servant in the world. Now, 10 years later, we are facing another season of choosing a new Secretary General. The corridors and cafeterias and dinner party culture around here hum with chatter about possible candidates. And there still is no procedure in place to choose a Secretary General. By the way, one highlight for all of us, but particularly for this audience, is that there is a lot of talk centered on the desirability of having a woman Secretary General for the first time, and a real conviction that now is the time for that to happen. Geographically, the choice, whoever she or he is, is supposed to come this year from Eastern Europe. But once again, that is also not written down anywhere. It's just an informal understanding. And already, there are rumors of interest from far-flung places on the globe. Thank you. I momentarily lost my place here. <laughs> but I'm glad to have that glass of water. Let me do that again. <clears throat> the General Assembly later this month 
is debating proposals to establish a process for selection of the Secretary General, but whether it will be in place to run a more orderly method this time than in the past is anyone's guess. And also, there are already rumors of people um, who, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place again. Going back to the experience of selecting a new Secretary General in 2006, at the time, the Council on Foreign Relations asked me to preside, as I just mentioned to you, at Mr. Bond's initial appearance there as he made known his candidacy to an audience of several hundred council members. We were seated in seats on a stage there, side by side. And I remember thinking sympathetically about him that it was no fault of his own, but it was difficult for him to lay out what the job involved and what he imagined his own contribution could be because there was so little independent information for him to go on. And when he subsequently became Secretary General, his first year in office was, as first years always are, a difficult one because there was no game plan for an incoming United Nations head. That's just the kind of gap in knowledge that this independent commission we have means to fill. One of its purposes is to provide the incoming Secretary General with a better and updated notion of what the job entails and how the UN can become more effective. Established with the support of Canada and Norway, the ICM, this commission, is a two-year process designed to analyze the changing nature of contemporary challenges and make recommendations to strengthen the multilateral system. The rationale is that at its 70th birthday approaches, the UN remains the core of the multilateral system. The world body, together with the Bretton Woods institutions, that's the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which was the predecessor of the World Trade Organization, they were all conceived in the mid-1940s <clears throat> by the architects of the post-war order with the central aim of saving succeeding generations from the scourge of war on the one hand and the need to reconstruct and revive the global economy on the other. Over time, the system has showed remarkable endurance through many crises and continuously shifting geopolitical contexts. But despite this resilience, today's multilateral institutions are a product of a bygone era, grappling with fast evolving and unprecedented complexity of a new global landscape. Indeed, global governance structures and the traditional public institutions underpinning them are perceived by many to be out of step with emerging needs and the systemic challenges of the 21st century. Over the last 25 years, the spread of democratic governance, information technology, and economic globalization have provided expanded opportunities for countless numbers of people around the world. At the same time, New challenges from rising inequality to increasing geopolitical competition and transnational terrorism have posed unprecedented risks to the global system. <clears throat> Most recently, <clears throat> political extremism has become increasingly manifest in waves of disturbing and sophisticated propaganda, taking on new shapes and contexts with profound implications for global peace and security. As agents of chaos continue to challenge the forces of order, the international system finds itself at a crossroads that calls for a serious reevaluation of the bedrock of today's multilateral environment. The diagnosis must begin with an incisive look at new threats and challenges. The question is, can we turn this crisis into an opportunity? The launch of the Independent Commission on Multilateralism presents a unique opportunity for addressing the existing institutional structures with a view to making the system fit for purpose. That's a phrase you hear a lot these days here, fit for purpose. The chair, as I said, is Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia. Um, IPI, we are, have become the secretariat. We're doing the research and the work. And Hardeep Singh Puri, who some of you may know, uh, the former permanent representative of India, to the United Nations and currently a vice president at IPI 
will serve as the Secretary General. Over this two-year period, the ICM is analyzing the multilateral system through the lens of 15 issue areas, and each issue will be the focus of expert-level discussion. The resulting issues papers will be posted on the ICM website and circulated to seek external input before culminating in a final report. That report I mentioned it will come out the end of 2016 when a new Secretary General is entering office. <clears throat> the Commission will be traveling to world capitals to brief governments about its work, will be far outside this bubble, and to hear directly from them about their experiences, both good and bad, of working with the UN. It is widely consultative, reflecting international society in terms of geography, gender, and representative of a broad range of views from governments, intergovernmental institutions, civil society in the private sector, educators, and think tanks. The work of the Commission has a structure comprised of an advisory council of eminent persons, a ministerial level board, and an ambassadorial level board. And IPI will take the lead in drafting the final report. And that report will focus on issues, not institutions. It's quite an academic exercise with research papers prepared in advance for each of the 15 subject areas for retreats and new revised papers written afterwards incorporating the comments that emerge during the retreats. Those 15 studies will be the basis of the final report. Attendees include UN ambassadors and former prime ministers and foreign ministers, uh, experts, members of civil society, UN officials, teachers, research executives. The conversations are conducted under the Chatham House rule of non-attribution, and people speak in their personal capacity, not as representatives of their countries or institutions. I attend these retreats. There have been three so far, two at the Green Tree Estate on Long Island and one this past weekend at the Asia Society. They are remarkably lively and candid and rather stunningly self-critical for this community. My impression is that people are warming to the opportunity for speaking openly about their long-time frustrations and their long-term hopes for the multilateral system. More than once, people have begun their comments saying a little nervously, I hope we are taking the Chatham House rules seriously. Examples of the subjects, there are 15, I won't give you all 15, but four or five examples are weapons of mass destruction, non-proliferation, disarmament, that's one subject. Women, peace, and security, second subject. Global health, third subject. Justice, human rights, and international legal system, a fourth subject. Forced displacement and migration, a fifth subject. Humanitarian engagements, a sixth subject, and there are nine more. The inaugural retreat in February discussed the overall state of a multilateral system that was created, as I said, in the wake of World War II, and now, while it has strengths, it struggles to meet many of today's challenges. The second was held March 13th at Green Tree, and we took up the subjects of social inclusion, political participation, and effective governance in challenging environments. And the third retreat held just this past weekend at the Asia Society addressed terrorism, including issues related to ideology, identity politics, and organized crime. We looked at the drivers of terrorism, the UN's counterterrorism architecture, and the present role of the multilateral system in the fight against terrorism. And while I can't tell you what those conversations were like, I was completely exhausted. It was eight hours of concentration, but hearing uh, such winning, uh, winning may be the wrong word, uh, so much commentary from unexpected places, commentary that did not follow the lines of consensus and, um, and were intellectually really stimulating. Um, and it made me very excited to be part of this whole thing, and maybe that's why I talk about it at such length here. Um, I'll be through in a second. I want to get on to one last point. Um, many of the participants of these re retreats have taken the occasion to give interviews on the Commission, which we publish on the Commission website, which is, which is icm2016.org. And I'd like to quote from just one of them, since it rather neatly ties together my opening thoughts about how conflict-ridden the world appears today and how this commission can work to address the situation. The speaker was Gert Rosenthal, 
the former permanent representative of Guatemala to the United Nations, and he noted that the multilateral system acts as a safeguard against global tensions that evolve into conflict and conflicts that really grow in scope. It's a break on conflict, I would say, he said, and it also has the proactive role of promoting different initiatives on the part of member states, which point in the direction of compliance with the bigger goals of the UN Charter, the main one being to allow the world to have peaceful societies. Now, let